everybody. I'm happy to be here with all of you. And uh, it'd be great to know where you all are from. Even if you want to put it in the chat, it will be nice. So at least I can have an understanding of uh, whom I'm talking to. Uh, I'd like to start because there's lots to say. And I want to talk for about some time and then I want to leave it for question answers. So it's going to be like half an hour of me talking and half an hour then of Q and A's with everybody. Uh, does that work? Yeah. So I think everybody, it'd be great if I could get your names and where you're working. So start with me. Um, so we're, um, the Missing Link Trust primarily works on prevention of trafficking, and we use very innovative mediums and engaging manners to do that. We have, um, so that's the way we are. And today I'm going to talk to you about how can we do communications and programs for change? That's the uniqueness which I want to, which I bring on board and which I want to share with all of you. So that's the next slide. So these are the kind of stats which we are seeing in India today that 200 children and 680 women go missing in India, even today. And I think this is quite an understated figure because these are just the reported figures. And there will be much more. So how does Missing do what we set out to do? Our main two pillars of work are we educate and we empower. Because we realize that both these pillars are really important for any work in prevention of trafficking. And um, so in educate, what we look at is creating mass awareness and a systematic school programs, which I will talk to you about in detail. So our pillars being educate, where it's all over India, and empower, we kind of work in a very focused manner in Sundarbans, which West Bengal accounts for 44% of India's trafficking victims. And Sundarbans is one very vulnerable community right at the Bay of Bengal. And we, uh, I was introduced to communities there way back in 2014. And we continue to work there because we see a mass flux of um, So we have a very uh, focused group of people whom we work with in Sundarbans, and we continue working there today because there's a mass flux of the inhabitants of this area which go, which are trafficked all over the country. And we have a blueprint which we'll be happy to replicate in any other area which uh, is looking at prevention of trafficking within a certain space or uh, area. So how do we do our work in prevention using education. This slide is quite a very, very uh, important slide for us because this is giving us and uh, this makes us, helps us make people understand how we do what we do. Our programs, what we do is like, I'm an artist. So it started with me primarily thinking I was not going to be able to knock at every door. So how can we create mass awareness as well as there is a requirement for a systematic awareness. So our program is inside out. We have a mass awareness, uh, started with me creating the missing game for a cause. The missing game is a game for change. It's a very powerful genre. It maps very strong TOCs for change. We have murals, which you can chat with and it's an immersive experience. We have an AR app, which goes over one of our missing silhouette. And then we have, of course, the missing silhouette, which is the crux and the mainstay of our whole campaign. It's been, uh, it's kind of become a very important icon of um, establishing uh, a dialogue on anti-trafficking. And uh, we kind of work with the silhouette in an intensive way in our school program, in cities and murals across the board. We have comics, which we have developed with the International Justice Mission in Kolkata. We use it for police training, for, for junior prosecutor training, and uh, with the help of uh, government bodies as well as civic bodies. We also use very powerful PSAs. PSAs are public statement organized uh, announcements, and they have been used very popularly for other issues like anti-smoking, Save the Tiger. And I think this is a very important way which we can really throw a mass net at a bigger audience through, through uh, screenings, through WhatsApp campaigns, through YouTube, through all the different mediums, because PSAs have known to be really powerful in the way they can really um, start that first dialogue on prevention and reach the target audiences. 
And now we more, we, though we used to have a social media for change, but we've realized it's a very important tool which we want to include in our tools for change. It's a very focused agenda. It really deals with something more focused. So that's one of our tools here. Through the, all these tools, you, if you can see it's an inside out expo, uh, uh, um, process. There's a cyberspace, there is an online space, there is a public space. And the crux and the core of it is the school program, which we have. It's, it's called the Missing Awareness and Safety School Program. It's an inside out. So it's children, it's students, it's caregivers, it's parents, it's villages, it's communities, and then it's cities. So this is the way the whole uh, program and our different initiatives work in the education space. In the empowerment space, okay, this is another way. In the, in the education space, why are we looking at innovations and innovative mediums? It's really becoming important to really know that the smartphone is a very important area to acknowledge in its own self. In India, we have about 800 million smartphone users. 75% of the internet users are consuming internet in regional languages. So localization of our communication is becoming really important for us in our communications with the masses. And this is, of course, the global internet users. So we can see it's huge. It's, I think, 57% of the world's population is online. That's one stat which we had. So we can see that more and more, it's becoming a very important space for us to address the online space. So why, so talking about the gamification. So if you're talking about so the first point which we really touch on is building awareness. Awareness to the fact that you could get trafficked, how could you get trafficked? And though this topic is very, very serious, it's also a topic which a lot of people don't think is relevant to them. It's coming from a space where uh, a parent will say, oh, but my child is safe, they won't get trafficked. It's coming from a place of where the teachers or the principal says, oh, my school doesn't have any trafficking. It's coming from a place where our smart teenagers say, oh, I'm never likely to get trafficked. And we all have seen such narratives not really holding true because we have seen trafficking or sex abuse and exploitation happening of children across different strata of society. So what we really use is gamification for behavioral change. So the most important understanding for us has been through our missing game for a cause. We, uh, and then we also have the AR app the AR app is going to help us uh, actually make a person rescue a girl through a gamified version of a rescue. But it's also going to leave behind some very important learnings of laws, of what is a mindful citizen has to do legally, what they have to do, like a bystander laws are there, even the fact that what are the numbers which one need to keep in mind? What is actually a trajectory if you've come to know if there is a missing case, what could you do to really save the person? So through a game, you kind of help rescue a girl. Then we have murals. Our murals, I will talk a little bit more about. We have the stencil project, which also is a very powerful way of giving ownership of the issue to people. So we use all these different methodologies to increase the learner's motivate, I mean, a, a learning capacity, improve knowledge retention because a gamifi gamification is now also being used in education because we've realized the importance of that factor to really make people understand the issue even deeper. And that's what we do. So I'm gonna show you a little trailer of our missing game for a cause. It's had an amazing run. I never had, uh, I mean, We've, we've never spent a penny on its marketing, but it hit the top of the charts in Google Play Store in Bangladesh. The moment we had a Bengali version, it's had about 1 million organic downloads across the world, 70 plus countries. And we've had reviews from across the world in the early days. And of course now uh, we still have to, we've just now launched it in 12 Indian languages and we just put it out. So we are in the next phase of really reaching more target audiences. Um, Devina, can you please? Uh, Switch on the trailer.
The game's available for free to be played and it's there on the App Store and on the Google Play Store. Please do play it. But the game, what's really powerful about what the game sets out to do is that it's maps, there's a full theory of change which is mapped on the game. And uh, it takes the player into a journey of a victim. And what's really powerful is that uh, what's really been the game changer here is we put the player in the feet of the victim and we make him run for his life, him or her run for their life, which has been quite a game changer or a, uh, it's been a very powerful way of impacting the players. So the TOC, which we map out here, which you can see is the players become aware of sex trafficking. We got so many reviews which said, hey, I didn't even know this happens. I didn't know that the girl standing in the red light is probably a traffic victim because most of the time it looks like as if they are standing there of their own will because they have to lure customers. They have to look as if they are enjoying it. So they really, the whole narrative is lost there, the back narrative. Players get to know about more about learning about the plight of the victims of trafficking out here, because in this game, they see how they are put into black holes, these dungeons, and how they are broken, how their whole will is broken, and then how they're readily put out. Players will understand how they contribute to the demand of sex trafficking, because out here, when every time you go and buy her, it's like every time she makes money, that's what the pimp wants. And so they understand their role in the rising demand of, of trafficking. Players will know the national child line number. That's what we've embedded within the game. And because in India, there is one national child line number, thankfully, so we embedded that. The game builds empathy for the victims and mobilizes players to speak up on the issue because then we got so many reviews saying, hey, something should be done. We should, we should stop this. Why is this allowed? So it gives the people a kind of a voice and a willing to talk about the victims. It sensitizes them. And also they come to know the role they play in the rising demand, like I said earlier, and the role they can play in rescuing victims, how they can help rescue others in the similar scenario. So that's like a TOC which we mapped to the game. The game has been really successful. And there are, the game has actually had been a part of a thesis of a diverse uh, game professor in Sweden. So these are the kind of understandings which we've come back with it. It has um, wicked elements. It has the elements of play because anything which we do today has to be gamified. It's a very, very, uh, not the most best word to say it, but it has to be, the learning has to be passive. If we go thump the Bible on anybody, nobody wishes to listen because there's too much of moral going out. So what's really important is that to make the game or the interaction or the innovation really uh, something which is a game first so that the learning is passive. And this is a slide which I can leave behind with you so you can understand what you actually go back with within the game how you feel the story, how it's unintentional learning, it addresses the complex issues and layers of trafficking and what uh, one sees on the fore and the face of trafficking and red lights and what's actually going on behind. And it addresses all of that quite beautifully. That's just to give you a little understanding of our game. We've actually won many awards for it. Uh, when I won the first award, I first made the game in Bengali because our target audience was Sundarbans, little realizing that there's a whole country, Bangladesh, which speaks Bengali. And before I knew it, uh, the Google Play Store in Bangladesh was spiking it and we hit the top of the charts in Google Play Store. We overtook the most popular game out there. And we've also seen that the game has been really highly played in high trafficking countries of the world. That's Bangladesh, Indonesia, Philippines, Brazil. These are some of the countries other than India and America, which has seen a really high uh, user of the game, payers of game. These are some of the quotes which we received. This is just one of them. We've had somebody says, uh, saving the girl made me feel as if I had saved my friend whom I lost last year. Somebody said, this is the most important game to be made. I mean, there should be more games like this because the power of making such games. And of course, there is more here, which you can read on the screen. The next very powerful tool of engagement I'd like to talk to you about is the missing girl silhouette. It started with me as an artist who wanted to create this huge public dialogue on trafficking. 
So I, for years, I had worked in the red light districts of the city. I'd worked in Kalikat, in Bau Bazar, in Khidarpur, and I was working with friends and NGOs who were working with their uh, children of 150, the women of 100, and really transforming their lives. But I could always see that they had a struggle of how to make sure that the next girl who hit puberty didn't go back into prostitution, didn't go back into second generation prostitution, however much you empowered her. And I could see that they were struggling with that. And their main cry used to be, is demand. The demand for these girls is leading to, are these girls getting more vulnerable? So I said, if these people are struggling with second generation prostitution, how can we make sure that we prevent first generation? And this whole dialogue with the public, I couldn't see it happening. I could see that there was a very big divide between the NGOs or anybody working in the red line and the world outside. So I created a public artwork titled Missing. It was the shape of a girl and it was launched at the India Art Fair. It's a black hole. It was it's set against the sky like public art installations. They are black holes set because it looks like as if you've cut out the sky into which millions of girls disappear from the face of the earth. So I did that, I had terrific launch, huge media coverage across the world. UK Guardian covered it, Al Jazeera, HuffPost. But I was, I was it, it, it difficult for me as an artist to traverse between the public private red tapes of India. So what I did was I said, let me not stop it here. And I started a whole guerrilla art campaign with this silhouette. And today I think there are more than 5,000 in India and across the world. And it's, it, it's like any other public in, uh, impression. It has great eyeballs. And I've had people across the world who say, hey, I've seen the silhouette and it's so powerful. And it starts the dialogue on, uh, on trafficking. It's been a great starter for us to make people feel the ownership of it. Like you can see in the clip out here, I've had people from the road who say, can I also spray? And the moment they spray, I've heard, an ice cream man in one of the schools I went back to, I said, I was asking one of the girls, do you know what this means? He says, let me tell you what this means. This girl is a missing girl. She's a girl who doesn't have any agency, who's lost all say, and she's gone into the dark holes of trafficking. And that totally delights me as an artist. And I think it's a powerful tool. And I'd like to show you what happens when you put it into schools. Mr. Chan, the video, please. So at the end of every school program, we do a missing girl silhouette where the children themselves stencil it. We leave behind the child line number. We give a hashtag so that everybody can connect to the campaign wherever they see it. So we are using all elements of social media of different ways to connect with, uh, with the audiences and public on the issue. And the beauty of it is that every person, every child who does this, this stencil becomes a spokesperson of the missing girl. We feel they take complete ownership of the issue. And that I think is, going, is a game changer. It's no more about an issue about another girl. It's about, it's our issue and we have to make sure that everybody's safe. So this takes me to my next very innovative um, initiative is the mural project. So what we did is we got this really amazing opportunity with change.org in, in, in New Delhi, who had a campaign called Choke the Demand, and they wanted to engage with us of how we could create an immersive public art intervention. So I did get the fact that we could do murals, but for me, that was not enough. And I feel um, there's so much more in the narrative which has to go across. So what we did was very unique. We created a mural with a chatbot. And today everybody has a Facebook Messenger or any other chatbot. So we, anybody could scan a QR code. So let me just take you through the little video here, which is self explains how it works. So you go to the placard, you scan the, the QR code, you go to Facebook and then you have a conversation. So you, you have a conversation with the visual. At the moment, this visual is of Kolkata. Otherwise, you, in Delhi, you visual. This is the visual. These are the murals. You choose the mural. Where are you? Standing in front of. And then you press start. And then you have a conversation with the mural. It starts very simplicity, like, oh, she seems like she's angry or she's cut her hair. Does she look happy? A very simple, engaging conversation, which goes deeper into the layered um, 
uh, ways how children are getting trafficked today. So in New Delhi, what we did is that we connected to the audiences with the, because New Delhi is called the rape capital of, of the world because of the high sex abuse on the roads of New Delhi. So what we did out here is we picked up very infamous quotations from, from politicians of New Delhi, like boys will be boys. Then there's another very um, powerful quotation, not powerful, very notorious quotation. Uh, rape is 90% 90, 90 of all rape is consensual. These are quotations which have been made by law enforcers and we wanted to bring that to highlight. So that's what we did here. In the next slide, you can, you can see how we've worked it out. Um, so out here, boys with our boys, they make mistakes. And another mural was dealing with koi jan buchkar balatkar nahi karta. It means nobody rapes by purpose. The third one was is rape to apasi raza mandi se hoti hai. Rape usually is consensual. These are all very infamous quotes by politicians, which we picked up and we created murals on the basis. And each of these murals, you can actually chat with them. Uh, it's there on the missing mural walk on Facebook Messenger. And it's very powerful. It's very immersive. In Calcutta, we dealt with the patriarchal structure of the society. And we've had audiences go completely silent, who start by being very engaged, but it's very thought provoking. We've had amazing quotations from Catherine McKinnon, uh, uh, who, who has actually given us the definition of sexual harassment. And she says, I usually have a problem with what art does with this issue. And I think what you've done is beautiful. I have no complaints with it. And I've had IGM say, this is really intelligent art. So I'd love all of you to go explore this, uh, these murals too. We are collaborating with organizations to put this out in whole of Northeast of uh, India in coming September and October. We are collaborating with other organizations. So this is a great space to collaborate on to create a public intervention. We have, the, we have a comic, which we can also show you a trailer of. Comics also for free. It's available on Google Play Store as of now. It primarily works on, it also talks, talks about a bystander law. It talks about uh, junior prosecutors, what they have to be mindful of if there's a survivor. And it also talks about the new age of trafficking, which is cyber enabled. It's about how easy to pay for a victim is online. And it talks about all these different ways uh, of trafficking. It was made with conjunction with International Justice Mission Kolkata. And it's to be put out with uh, for police training and for junior prosecutor training, mainly. Um, we totally believe in that to really engage audiences today, it's really important to make everything what we do really interactive. Now, it takes me to the, I really want to talk to you a little bit more detail about the school program which we've created. So uh, Missing set out by doing an awareness school program way back in 2016 with the Women and Child Welfare Ministry of uh, West Bengal. We got the opportunities to reach three districts of Kolkata. We, uh, it was an amazing learning. We, um, it was the one hour program, which kind of touched, uh, touched who, what is trafficking, who can get trafficked, who, is, who, who enables trafficking, who can a trafficker be, and how are we responsible for trafficking and, and the rising demand. And it touched on all these facets. 
and it, it had the game clips, it was very engaging. But all over the two, three years we worked in this space, we realized and we got more feedback from principals and from caregivers that this program cannot be just a one hour program. It has to be more deeper. It has to really to touch behavior change other than just the basic uh, understanding. It has to be more uh, deeper especially because you already have a hardened uh, audience in 15 to 16 year olds today, because if people have been watching uh, explicit material online already from the age of 12, it takes a long time for them to really have a behavior change out here and to connect the dots. So what we did is under COVID, we sat back and created a more detailed curriculum. We have uh, the whole program is on the basic premise of awareness leads to prevention. The whole program is audio so that there is no loss in any um, in, in, in any training. The program gives learners agency. It doesn't it says don't do this, do this. I, the trailer will explain to you. It's localizable. It can be localized to any in any to any language. It ha, it works on the basic premise of learning to teach because it's really important to really hit the subconscious so that when you learn, then you go out to teach and it reinforces what you are learning. And it's all narrative based, it's all storyline based. Can we show the trailer here, please? Students of today learn the basics of maths, physics, computer science, art, and other subjects that give them the tools to imagine and build a world they want to live in. Often this education overlooks the tools the students need to build a strong foundation within themselves to lead a safe and secure life. Some fundamental questions for adolescents are never truly addressed. How do I keep myself safe in a rapidly changing world? What does complete freedom from physical and emotional abuse look like? Can I be different from my peers and still be accepted? How much of a role do I play in keeping myself and the others around me safe? The Missing Awareness and Safety School program takes these questions head on. The program, designed with the help of experts exclusively for adolescents, guides them to answer these questions for themselves. The program is not a collection of cautionary tales, but an integration of essential and actionable information on safety. Students are not expected to be passive learners, but active participants. They share their learnings with their peers and communities and emerge as change agents. The MASPI is fun, thought-provoking and an opportunity for adolescents to come into their own. Enroll for MASP now. So this gives you a little gist about what the program is. And I can take, tell you a little bit more. So the program has been designed in such a way because we realize in children, there are a lot of children who don't have access to mobile devices or smart devices. Because if the whole program is audiovisual, it's really important that we are able to reach the last child. So the program has a web portal to reach children with schools, with computers and laptops. It has a WhatsApp module because there are a lot of NGOs today who have smart devices and tablets, which they are able to give to their adolescent beneficiaries. So we have a chatbot version and we have the offline version, which at the moment we are rolling out in Sundarbans through schools, as you can see. And um, the offline version is fully audiovisual with the help of facilitators and all the m &E is done through workbooks and through forms so that we can get a full understanding of their learnings before and after. The program has five modules so far. We do have three more modules ready to be put out, but we've only built five so far. Critical thinking modules, which are the main ones. We have an awareness 101. The awareness 101 talks about trafficking. Though I know a lot of schools might feel, why do I don't want to know about trafficking? But for us, sex abuse, exploitation, leads to tra trafficking. So we talk about an awareness 101. We have cyber safety in a really rigorous way, talking about all forms of cyber abuse, cyber um, everything. It talks about all the cyber faced issues which we are all facing today because so many children have come online. And we have the adolescent education. 
today, I mean, sex ed in India is still not so streamlined. And I think across the world also, I don't know how well it is. In the US, we did see that there was a drop of sex education in schools as per state agenda, which I feel is a real, uh, is actually something which is affecting the rising figures of trafficking. Because today, teenagers are faced with a lot of explicit sexual material. We are seeing that they are sexually active way earlier. So it's really important to give them educa an adolescent education, to give them agencies of their body, to give them the right to choose, as well as understand what their body is going through, and it, which will lead to their mental health, and you know, which will make them stronger human beings. So we have that as a very intensive module here because it's, a, it's an important part of sex abuse, exploitation, trafficking. And then we have the creative thinking modules. The creative thinking modules, we make them create their own board game. We made them create their own rules, their own um, risks, their own to-dos and don'ts. These are all ways of reinforcing their learning and understanding of the issue. We have, we also teaching them how to use social media for good. So we give them actually tools of how to run a very powerful social media campaign, which is actually used only by experts, but we are making them experts. It's also a way to really increase their understanding of how social media can be used for other issues they might be interested in. But we give them language, we give them agency to talk about sex abuse, exploitation, and to speak up and to be more um, forceful about the wrongs which they can see around them. The school program maps the theory of change. Because if, I, if my problem statement is that there are vulnerable who are getting trafficked, so if you say, how do we educate vulnerable adolescents on the hazards of most severe forms of exploitation, such as trafficking and any other form which are less severe, like uh, abuse and exploitation online or offline? That's what we are addressing. And how do we keep, how to keep themselves safe from these forms of exploitation? So we map that through the whole program, through uh, how they can have an increased understanding, increased awareness, and they can become advocates for change how they can keep themselves safe, how they can help keep their peers safe, and how, do, how they can speak up, and how they can, how can this awareness lead to a, in a prevention in a larger state of a uh, larger community? So how we can really keep our future generations safe from both angles, as vulnerable community, as well as how they can become mindful of being demand makers. So we can now give them a whole understanding of the whole, reasons why trafficking happens today. So going to one very important uh, mode which we are using today is the power of social media. It was addressed even this morning in the prevention panel with my other panelists, and I'm happy that everybody spoke about social media. Sometimes in organizations like ours, like how it started, social media was just by the way, we kind of did it. But we have realized again and again that it's a very important and powerful tool for us because today the entire country's population in India, 67% is on social media. I mean, these are the kind of stats which we are seeing. Every fifth Indian is an adolescent with so many people, smartphone users. So it's really important that we become more savvy in using this space for good. So what we are doing is, especially what we are doing is we are trying to focus on a really good campaign in Sundarbans because there under COVID, we've seen a real sharp hike of consequences of adolescent sexuality. More children were online. There was more elopement, more um, uh, exposure to sexually explicit material, more openness to exploring their sexuality, which has led to a lot of children getting exploited and abused. So what we are doing is we are really going for a very powerful social media campaign in Sundarbans, which I think is replicable across the country. And we are, the whole social media campaign uses all these elements of reels, blogs, posters, uh, pop-ups, it's got full CTAs, and it's dealing targeted with elopement, with child marriage. So every child, every girl in India, because of Bollywood, the way it is, everybody thinks, oh, I'll get married and I'm going to start dancing around trees, or I'll go to Switzerland, because that's where they see all the stars are doing. And they're actually children there who think that, oh, uh, I'm smart, I'm old, I don't need to study more because they have very lack of aspirations, there is no ambitions, and they also know from the community that they are bound to get married sooner than later. So they're jumping into marriage before they can even think it, and 
this is something which we are seeing is actually uh, given rise to a lot of sex abuse, exploitation and trafficking. So we are targeting our posts specifically for teenagers, showing them a journey of a girl who gets who gets married early and a journey of a girl who doesn't get married early and what she can do with her life, the kind of agencies, the kind of life, fulfilling life she can lead. So what I feel is a very powerful um, platform which can be used for specifically addressing any pain point which we are facing with specific narratives, with specific CTAs, and with uh, which can actually prove to be very powerful. I mean, I'm again and again say social media should be used with in its um, to its full capability and capacity today. So other than this, we're also doing other immersive modules like podcasts, documentaries, public service announcements, and we have an AR and VR app coming up. I think I've, uh, I've gone way beyond my 30 minutes. I'm gonna open this out for anybody else uh, who wants to ask me questions. So these are some of the other uh, platforms which we are using for change. I could talk a little bit more about it. The podcast which we are creating is actually really beautiful. We have addressed eight different forms of uh, abuse and exploitation today. So we're talking about poverty. We're talking about child marriage. We're talking about um, we're talking about cyber safety. We're talking about adolescent sexuality. We're talking about uh, juveniles and uh, children in conflict with law. And we're talking about survival and reintegration. So these are the multiple topics which, which we've picked up with experts. And we've created a podcast on each of them. And I feel this is an excellent, uh, because of its popularity today, it's an excellent medium. Yeah, can you please switch the slide so we can end it and I can take the questions now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. I'd be open to questions. Has anybody got any questions? I'm happy to see so many of you from across, from Thailand, Philippines, Hong Kong. I'd love to connect with you all. Please do keep our email address and please do share with us a little bit about all your organizations. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do any of you work with any adolescent community? There is a question on the chat box, Lena. Could you share some of the challenges for conducting this engaging media through community? Um, you mean to say the school program? Um, the school program, we do face challenges. We have our trainers, our facilitators who go out and some of our uh, facilitators do face problems while they're talking about, of course, the adolescent education section. So what we do is we try and feel the nerves of the society when they're going in. And if certain sections are too explicit for them, we keep them, um, we, we don't expand on them. We try to keep the narratives which suit that community because uh, it's no point us saying no. Like there is an image of say how to use a condom. So somebody might say, oh, why should my community even know that? Because I'm trying to tell, uh, by, by even talking about it, I'm giving them a green signal that they can use it. No, it's not the case. So, um, so we kind of keep that a little, if they have a problem with that, we kind of keep that a little low. And we talk about how to be, uh, using, uh, how to be using safe, safety procedures during sex what they should do, what they shouldn't do. So we kind of move our narrative around the requirement of the community. So that's the way we kind of face it, but more or less the acceptance of the program has been great. Everybody says there's a great requirement for this. Schools are saying it, teachers are saying it because 
um, there is a percentage of any organization which sees children who get victims of abuse and exploitation. And, uh, and I think caregivers are very sensitive to that. So they really, okay, I have another one here. So for the stencil project, I saw online this vandalism and gra graffiti on top of the painting. That's really sad. How that, so for us, it's not a hatred response. I feel any response is a good response. And so it also gives us an opportunity to strike a uh, dialogue with the community. So once when we did see a kind of, um, um, somebody had made some, you know, some drawings over our girl. So we actually brought up a big public furor. So instead of missing or Lena talking, I think before I knew it, there was a big debate going on and it started the whole community engaging on it, which I feel is a plus point. Any engagement is good. And it's the other stakeholders become spokespersons for every missing girl who's got getting explo exploited. So I feel um, that I'm not deterred and I think it's totally good to start these conversations when they happen. Uh, what age group are more vulnerable at risk? So of course, see, it's about poverty being makes them more vulnerable. But today under the cyber space, our work with experts has led us to believe that first timers on social media, like ideally it should be 12 or 13 year olds. It could be younger because of course, nobody's really mapping their age. We really hope that the social media giants get that in place. But it's first timers on social media who could become the target of predators. They study these, uh, these children, they follow them, and they will probably follow them for three months before they really go into some space where they feel totally at home with. They'll, or they'll, they'll, add, they'll enter their school groups, they'll enter their hobbies groups, they'll enter their gaming groups, they'll enter uh, different groups. Within that, they will start the conversation in a very, very relaxed manner, like a friend who is probably one of them. And then once they've gained the confidence of the child is when they really, uh, we've seen ex uh, trafficking happen. So I think for us, the target age today should be the first timers on social media. And how can we make sure that we are educating them on how they, uh, on digital civic sense? Hi. Yeah, hi, anybody wants to say? Okay, so I got another question. Do you provide any legal support to the victims? Yes, we do. We have um, we have collaborations and partnerships with I Pro Bono and International Justice Mission. Um, we we do have our rescues and we do have our victim survivor programs going on in Sundarbans. So we definitely provide support to victims as and when it's required, right from the first JD to FIRs to everything. Do you engage with missing boys? We haven't had any cases of missing boys yet, but for us, it's not about the gender. It's going to be about anybody who needs help. I've had one-to-one uh, -one cases come up to me of a young man, a young adult who went missing, whom we happen to uh, connect and get back. Um, so we do definitely, we work with boys and girls. Great, Hollis, it'll be great if you can share more about your anti-trafficking programs. We'd be happy to really share about our school program with anybody of you who has an adolescent um, community who, would, who you'd like to put the program out to. And uh, it's really about reaching every last child to make sure that we can all collectively keep a, make a safer world for children. Are there any other questions here? Sure. I think we can keep a note of all the email IDs here, Devlina, so that we can send some everybody a mail. Are there any questions I missed? Okay. We have a program recently to record scripts of trafficking victims and That's great. We'd love to access the program. If it's okay with you, do, share, do let us know how we can. Because every time it's a, it's a learning because traffickers are using such new and innovative ways to traffic. So it's more important to learn what's happening worldwide. 
we'd be happy to share what we know. Aren't you able to unmute yourselves or something? I don't Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm happy to inspire and get inspired. Oh, your audios are closed. I wonder why. Can we not switch on the audio for everybody? I think I cannot unmute anybody. It would have been nice to hear everybody. Thank you so much. Um, not really, we're not facing any challenges with the Indian government. I think the Indian government is being very proactive. Uh, we have the National Child Rights Protection Commission who is holding round tables to really understand the issue. They totally, um, they really want to work on prevention. So, I, I mean, we're not really facing any challenges. In fact, a government partnership is really important to take the work, work ahead. And I feel they're being proactive about it so far. I hope whoever gets to work with them, I think every, every work, everything done with them is helpful way ahead. The only challenge actually is about the state and national. Sometimes when you go into a state, you have to do the state uh, government bodies. If it's national, it's national. So that kind of is a little bit of a conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Sharda. I'd be really happy to know more about all your work. Is there a legal instrument to combat human trafficking? Uh, what do you mean exactly, legal instrument? Laws? Yeah, I mean, the laws are getting there. I don't understand what you mean by legal instrument. Of course, yes. You have the Indian Penal Code. You have the POXOs now, which is very strong. You have, um, so the laws are all there, but what's really is a deterrent is the cases and how fast do they take to really come to light. There is the express services for cases and survivors. Uh, but I've had one survivor case, which is going on now for the last four years through COVID before that. And what's really sad is like every time the victim has to rethink and always have to remember what happened to them and which is very traumatic. So the laws are there, but convictions are low. That's really sad. And I think the laws have to become stronger. There was a quotation I read, or somebody said, that it's more likely that you're going to be hit by lightning than to be put behind bars for trafficking. I mean, how sad is that? Um, I just hope you get to rectify that. I'd hope I could unmute all of you.
Hollis, do share your program where you recorded all the victims' voices. Uh, have you faced any situation where you rescued someone and their consent changes after a certain time? Um, not me, not directly, though we have known people who do that. Um, what we have seen is in communities, especially rape victims. We've seen a turnaround there because they get a lot of pressure from the family, from the community to drop charges. So we've seen great victims who've actually dropped charges and uh, so you are you talking about where you have a rescued someone and their consent changes what do you mean by their consent you mean to say that they voluntarily go back into trafficking we've had one such case we had a victim where we saw she went back because uh, society just wasn't ready to accept her and she was being so victimized that she actually went back into to the place where she came from, where she had been rescued from. Yes, we have. I had one special, one such case where it actually happened. The victim was from Ghaziabad in uh, UP. And like most girls from Sundarbans go from east to west. She was taken there and um, it was due to one of the rescue missions of the police that she managed to come back. But once she was back, she was, um, the, the community just wouldn't let it be. And there was no uh, survivor integration plan and she was victimized further. And uh, before we knew it, she actually ran back. Sundarbans BD part or only? I'm only working in Sundarbans, India, in the Kultoli block. We hope to do some border work now. I'm actually reading the questions in the chat if anybody is getting confused. I'm answering directly. I'm not repeating the question. Are you planning for the border work? Yes. In fact, um, I think we've just been approached by the National Child Rights Protection Commission to do some border training for junior prosecutors. We work beyond borders also with any organizations. So we are actually just now working with an organization in Africa for, for sharing our program with them. We'd be happy to work with any organization who would like to take the program to their communities? We don't have a collaboration in Nepal as of now. We'd be happy to collaborate. Which area of Nepal do you work in? Oh, 
Okay, great. I met, of course, I'm sure Anuradha Koirala, everybody knows her. So I did, I've gone and met her a few times, but we've never really worked together yet. Be happy to collaborate. We worked a lot at Forbes Ganj in India, which is on the border of Bihar and Nepal, which also sees a very big flux of Nepalese girls who come there, they come into India. I think we're nearly coming to the end of the session and be happy to answer any emails, any questions directly and I think we all need to have more partnerships here to really make our work effective. So I'm happy to know what each one of you does. Sure, we'll do that. Most of you are from really relevant areas of Indonesia, Philippines, Nepal, Bangladesh. We'd be happy to know more about all of you. We'll share with you all an email, whoever shared the IDs here, so that we can really see what we can do together. We'd be happy to roll out the school program to your community. We can even do mural projects. We are at the moment, like I said, collaborating with two or three organizations on the mural project. Sure, sure, we'll do that. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, thank you, everybody. I think this is the breakout session. It's 10.15, I think.